Come, come, please sit. Come, come, have a seat. To Arya, Rajasthan seemed a bit like this. Wow, we'll all fit. All of us. Welcome back to the 14th Jaipur Literature Festival protected by Detol. It's our pleasure to present today Experiencing the Goddess on the Trail of the Yoginis, Seema Kohli in conversation with Habiba Insaf with contributions from Anamika Rao, Stella Dupuy, Janet Chawla and Nilima Chitgopekar. Experiencing the Goddess is a book of essays that shares research, experiences, ideas and knowledge from studies and travels related to ancient sites where divine female energies dwell. In this session, C. Macaulay, who has contributed to the book, explores a vast range of themes surrounding rituals, scriptures, practices, and spiritual interpretations, and an alternative perspective on the aesthetic and philosophies guiding the yoginis. To talk about their contributions before that, please welcome Anamika Rao, Stella Dupuy, Janet Chawla and Nilima Chetkopekar. 64 yoginis suggest some mysticism. They were the 64 attendants of the great goddess. They were the 64 forms of the great goddess. And they were the 64 embraces of Shiva to Parvati. Moreover, unconventional structure open to the sky yogini temples. They invite more suggestions and they raise the question, why? It is an enigma to the art historians, to the worshippers, to the naive beholders. The book, it invites to explore more. What is Yogini? What is 64 Yoginis? Hi, I'm Janet Chavla and I'm a writer and researcher. So when I reread this book and my contribution in it, I couldn't believe that I had actually written it. And it was amazing that I had gone to all those places and that I had written this contribution to the book on the yoginis. The goddess is the theme that fascinated me since I was very young living in South America. And since I started to come to India, I became mesmerized by the expressions, the devotion that one can see and feel everywhere in this country. I wanted to share these experiences and my friends, the other authors, helped me to accomplish this dream. Every chapter of the book take the reader to diverse realms that we call the trail of the yoginis, the diversity in the unity. So my chapter, my essay in the book is basically talking about how you can look at Chaucer yoginis as sculptures, but you also can see and you can draw a parallel from how they have been described in a Puranic text. And so Puranic text is always considered the you know legitimate text, or it's always considered like the uh, the, the Brahmanical text, and and the yoginis are considered tantric goddesses. So the fact that you can have the tantric goddesses represented in a Brahmanic text, like the you know what I talked about is the Lalita Sahasranama, which is a part of the Brahmanda Puran, and uh, I have these I have seen these long descriptions of the goddesses there, which appear to be yoginis, and so I have drawn up. I've, I've said that we can bring together the sculpture that is uh, the yoginis from the temples and we can bring together with the scripture that is the Lalita Sahasranama, that is the thousand names of the goddess Parvati in the form of Lalita. Thank you Anamika Rao, Stella Dupuy, Janet Chawla and Nilima Chitko Bebkar for your brilliant conversation and contributing to this book. I'm now delighted to welcome Seema Kohli in a conversation with art historian Habiba Insaf. Seema Kohli is a multidisciplinary artist, a poet, a dreamer thriving on imagination, ideas, philosophies, narratives, oral histories, myths, and recreating these as images or words. Kohli has had over 32 solo shows and she explores the themes of beauty, sensuality, and spirituality expressed through her works based on the concept of Hiranya Garbha, or the golden womb from which we have all emerged, which is self-pervading, engulfs every single thing. In 2013, she self-published 
a compilation of verses, I Am, which was performed at TEDx Chennai. Her works have been shown at the collateral events of Kochi Biennale, Birthrights Collective, the Ven Venice Biennale of Art and Architecture, among many others. Habiba Insaf is an art historian and an incoming doctoral student at Humboldt University, Berlin. Her research interest lies in the history of museums, in particular questions of display and representation in ethnographic museums. She has held awards and fellowships of the Alexandra von Humboldt Foundation, Singapore International Foundation and the Prince Klaus Fund. Please do remember to comment by typing it into the comment section below. Ladies and gentlemen, experiencing the goddess on the trail of the yogini Seema Kohli in conversation with Habiba Insaf. Seema, Habiba, over to you. Hello, how are you all? Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be a part of JLF 2021 and I would like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone who's here with us for this virtual book launch. And yeah, I'm very excited and I'm looking forward to my conversation with Seema Kohli. Lovely. I'm as excited. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this conversation and sharing the book with you all, uh, our experiences. Uh, we are five authors of this book, Experiencing the Goddess on the Yogini Trail. Uh, we all have, we are all from different genres, but uh, we have the same passion. We have the same passion towards the feminine. And we all have tried to express it in the way we are closest, we feel closest to her. And I do hope uh, you are able to get the ha your hands on this book. And uh, also through the conversations, understand like what all we have done in this book. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, the conversation and try to learn more about the book. Uh, so as you said, there are five contributors and each one of you come from a very diverse discipline and expertise. Um, so as, as an artist, um, how do you approach the yogini in your artworks? See, for me, uh... Yogini is an energy. For me, I see her as an, a conduit of that energy. And how do you express that conduit? Because I'm an image person. I, you know, all my work is figurative. And how do I sort of put her into a form? The closest I see her as a feminine. And that's how I try to express her. And it is very important for me to give her a form uh, if I need to express it without any words, without music, without any other sensibilities. So my expression uh, becomes more of a figure. And it is a feminine figure because that is, uh, I, I see her as a collaborator. I see her as something which uh, sort of induces expansion. And how do you express inducing? How do you express collaboration? Like as a word and then uh, to give it a form, uh, uh, how I see uh, her is as a feminine. And so the, all the figures, everything, whether they are trees, whether they are animals, whether they are, so they do, even the men become quite, you know, they have a very feminine leaning uh, in my words. In the physical aspect and of course the other aspect also. Interesting. Uh, so since about three decades, I think your work has 
primarily been an exploration and celebration of this female form. Um, so can you tell us how and when did yoginis or goddesses or Shakti become your artistic views? For me, uh, it was even before, I think, uh, three decades. Uh, three decades, I think it sort of consolidated into this kind of mm -hmm. uh, genre of Shakti. But before that, also, I was uh, working on the idea of energy uh, in a very different kind of a way. And uh, how I got introduced to uh, the goddess was very, uh, very uh, different because uh, in our home, in my family home, uh, we belonged to RSMH, which was uh, no mm -hmm. idols in the house. And we had, in fact, uh, you know, uh, looking at Maya was something uh, the, at the lower step uh, because Advait was uh, sort of, that's what uh, everyone believed in and so did I. And I do also, it, it sort of carries on with me, but the love for the feminine uh, grew probably uh, because uh, as I was growing, I think uh, by eight, nine, something around that, all the qualities which I did not possess, probably, uh, you know, the strength and the, the confidence and uh, I, I think the whole demure was so beautiful when I saw her mm -hmm. uh, little sculpture uh, on the banks of Ganges in Haridwar and I was taken aback. Uh, and I think since that day, I was captivated by her and I started to rever her. I started to pray to her. Uh, I didn't know what to pray. I had no... Uh, the scriptural, you know, or the bhajans or something. It was nothing like that. I just was in love with this form. This form who was seated on a lion, very gracefully, very composed and in total control of herself and the lion itself. And I think that uh, itself uh, kept on growing. And over the years, uh, it was... Uh, much, much more, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to understand and my sources were either books or um, folklore from different people. Uh, I didn't get to hear much from uh, the, my home or something, but I did try to acquire it from wherever I could possibly get my, uh, get the, because it was uh, something that I can't say that I was possessed, but of course that 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 was something which uh, did uh, you know grasp all my attention. And then later, I wanted to uh, though I did my philosophy honors, but uh, uh, my interest in the goddess remained the same. And I started to express her in different forms, though they were not. Uh, uh, the traditional forms, they were the forms probably which I saw her in my personal capacity mm -hmm. and uh, that I st uh, still try to do it. And uh, I, uh, I see her, I try to connect with her in, uh, from the various uh, narratives, various myths, various cultures, traditions. Uh, and of course, I'm uh, taking the most out of the tantra. Uh, which is uh, also very close to me um, philosophically and also uh, practically, uh, I feel uh, it is a very relevant science. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more about your uh, approach and the process that you use in bringing yoginis to life on your canvases. You mentioned a variety of sources that you use. So how does, um, how, how do they come alive on the canvas? Uh, so, uh, the whole um, manifestation of uh, Yogini, which takes place on my canvases is through various sources. I like to research uh, through various sources. It is not only the books, but it is also the mm -hmm. music. It is also um, uh, 
uh, you know, various uh, folklores, mm -hmm. scriptures, uh, hearsay also, and my own uh, sense of imagination, uh, which sort of combines and my reverence towards it, uh, creating my own rituals, create, of course, understanding the rituals which are already there, but I like to also uh, I, I do my own rituals as a practice for the past so many years. And uh, I sometimes uh, feel like um, uh, a honey gatherer, as they say in Baal tradition, Madhukori, you know, like uh, you're gathering all the uh, various uh, information through so many sources and what sort of uh, gets on to my canvas or through my words is the essence of all that. And I really uh, feel very grateful and uh, humble about the, the fact that uh, I've been able to do all this. Of course, travel also is something which I uh, really do. And all of us, all four uh, uh, other uh, authors, we have been traveling also. I've been traveling on my own also, but uh, it is, uh, you know, a great privilege to have a company of, uh, of uh, your friends, authors and researchers who are trying to do, you know, the same things in a very different way, in a different expression. And uh, I travel also mm -hmm. a lot uh, to these sites, trying to uh, absorb myself into these dead sites. And they're not only sometimes the, the yogini sites or the shakta sites, but uh, they're also, uh, you know, maybe on the ba banks of Ganges, what I found, uh, I think, on the banks of Varanasi or Shivpuri, uh, I don't think I have ever found that connect anywhere else. Even the sea, I, I think everywhere, it's, she's everywhere. So it is just so wonderful. Yeah, the use of the honey gatherer metaphor was lovely. Um, so I want to uh, ask you if you want to share a little bit about, you know, your recent yogini works um, that you had created, your sculptures, and you want to just take us through your process in that so that we can understand your artistic interventions and your reimagination of traditional form and imagery. Yeah. I, uh, in fact, very recently had a very large uh, uh, exhibition and display of my yoginis, uh, which I did in uh, sandstone. It almost, there were Chausat yoginis and it took me almost eight years to do that work. Uh, how I started was because I started some uh, a body of etchings, which are also there in the book. Uh, and while I was doing the etchings, I traveled to Bhubaneswar. And when I was uh, in uh, one of the yogini sites, I actually was inspired to do my own yoginis. And I started to work on that, uh, on the sculptures. Uh, and all I was doing was trying to create new sculptures, new yoginis, because if you uh, understand the idea of energy, which is constantly uh, replenishing itself, uh, constantly renewing itself and constantly changing forms. And that's how we have so many forms of yoginis in different with different metaphors of animals, rivers, trees, everything. And that's what I started to express. And while I was working on that, I felt that I should also include the yoginis which, from which I got inspired from. So there are about uh, 32 yoginis which are from the traditional forms and there are 32 yoginis which are from, uh, our, from my own drawings. And then, of course, there was a Gambhari word uh, sculpture of Kali, which is uh, huge. I think that till then I had not done another sculpture as large as that, which also took me about eight years to uh, make. Wow. It is about 12 feet high. And uh, that also is the, where I have expressed her as uh, not only a destroyer, she's a very benevolent um, energy. And for me, uh, she uh, she's standing on 
sort of kickstarting a golden womb and holding the Kundalini in her hand uh, and in total control of herself. Uh, that is also on display in Sundan Nursery just now. And uh, there were a few more things, um, a few more sculptures which I did in bronze, which were a part of the Saptamatrikas that I did about uh, Mahisha Surmaradini and all. So they all expressing a certain aspect of energy. Because for me, energy mm. is a form which I have captive, uh, you know, which I've captivated in these images, right? But it is not only these images, which are the form, uh, which is a yogini, like it is all over. It is something which I try to capture and sort of put together and express it. That's my expression. But what I believe in is not only these forms as, uh, you know, these images as yoginis. Yoginis are everywhere as rivers, as mountains, as trees. So if we are revering the sculptures, we may as well rever the nature around us. It is uh, as important as that because they were just a manifestation of the aspects of nature because that is where the energy resides in human form, in animal form, in all the forms that are around us. It is not only just a manifestation in a certain uh, image that I've created. So uh, I like to connect with the, the spaces. That's, that's the only reason why uh, connecting with all the five senses is so very important to me. Because if I just, uh, you know, go through one, I read something and I express it, I'm not probably able to grasp that is my, um, you know, shortcoming. Uh, mm -hmm. I like to uh, imbibe these energies through mm -hmm. all the senses, which are all around us. Mm -hmm and then probably express it and express it. And that's what I've tried to do uh, in all these years. Uh, some of these were expressed uh, very recently and I showed. I also uh, express it through my own form uh, because I'm also mm -hmm. a part of that extended format of energy. And uh, so many times I have done uh, experiential performances to express this in dominant, uh, dominatable form, you know. And uh, yes, I, I'm totally in awe of it. So you mentioned that for you, yoginis symbolize positive procreation, creativity, right? It's, it's a energy. Um, so I wonder if your yoginis also at times feel fury. Are they also angry goddesses at times? They, they're not only, they cannot be an angry goddess if they are in a form uh, confined to a certain image. Of course, they would always have a form. Uh, but of course, we do have so many cyclones. We do have, and that is energy expressing itself. Landslides, all these kind of floods, all these kind of things, uh, you know, uh, they are energy expressing itself. It's nothing else but that. It is a very, very uh, alive. It's not dormant. It is expressing itself. And uh, it's for us to understand that language, to connect with that language, and uh, probably understand yeah. what is this leveling going on and how is it expressing it. Yeah. Um also want to know from you, um, you know, in the Indian contemporary art space, in my understanding, you're one of the few artists who paints goddesses and who heavily references mythology. Do you at times find that your art gets labeled as religious art or as traditional art? Do you at times fear being typecast because of certain themes or motives that you use and the interpretations that might emerge from them? which may be different from the way you intend them? Of course, that's always there, but that's, uh, that's the, probably the risk that we all artists are taking most of the time. And I am referring, it is not that my references are not coming from there, but my expression is more uh, yeah. unified. It is more uh, towards the fact that 
I'm expressing a very universal, uh, you know, um, it's uh, en energy is universal. It is not confined yeah. to any specific, uh, uh, you know, uh, part of it. We can express it differently. We can, uh, uh, you know, each culture, each tradition, each religion has a different expression to it. But uh, it is universal. We cannot deny that nature is universal. Mm -hmm. uh, it is all around us. It is, it is energy. It is uh, from where we have all sort of gathered and we are a part of it, connected to it. We are uh, as a whole, uh, you know, uh, I, I like to express energy in a way that I see myself as a, a, a part of that uh, a minuscule, uh, probably a small, uh, you know, atom of that uh, huge form of uh, this uh, goddess, goddess Kali, maybe because that's what mm -hmm. I remember the most. And uh, we are all apart, connected together somewhere or the other. And wherever yeah. connection fails, of course, uh, there is a problem. And uh, I think we all understand that. We all know that. Yeah. Um, also, in terms of viewers, uh, I'm just trying to understand. Um, so your artworks are figurative, but the ideas that they express mm -hmm. are quite uh, abstract and they, are, they have a solid basis in religion and mythology. So uh, does it matter to you that your viewer uh, have a certain knowledge of these narratives and stories that you use in your art? Not really. You know, because uh, that's the beauty of art, I think, because uh, it's not something which is, it is he heavily referenced, but it is a language that I use with my canvas. It is my coded language. Yeah. It is, uh, as we used to read as yes. children, you know, the secret language uh, of uh, children. So they used to have that separate ink or, uh, you know, uh, where you can't read anything. But at the same time, it is a conversation. It is a, convers a conversation that I'm having with my canvas. But of course, the moment I'm putting it up on display, everyone is... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, welcome to give their uh, you know interpretation and I'm very uh, I, I, I think because the whole idea of is of connecting the whole idea is of love the whole idea is of flowing the whole idea of behind my work is collaborations and you know sort of connecting Jordana uh, so that is what my whole uh, Till yet, my work has been all about, and I love to hear the stories uh, where people, uh, my viewers, my collectors, my, uh, you know, the people who are uh, interested in my work, when they give me their stories, I, I, I have another narrative which is added to my work, and uh, it is, it, it becomes yeah. much larger than just my work. It, it is my work till the time yeah, it is in my studio, but it is, uh, it's, you know, it, ga it gains a much bigger uh, meaning once it is, uh, it gets to people and they, they interpret it in the way they want. Of course, I also tell my story. Uh, I also express it in words, but my um, uh, best expression is my image. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true what you talked about, just opening the interpretation to whoever wants to offer one. Um, all right, so we before we move on to the book reading, uh, I just want to ask you last question. Would you want to share any forthcoming exhibition, show of yours, something yeah. that we can look forward to? Yeah, I am uh, heading for a midlife uh, kind of uh, uh, retrospective where I would be... Lovely. Uh, showing uh, my work since last uh, 40 years, 35, 40 years. Uh, it's surprising that I still have them. <laughs> but, uh, they are uh, very safely, uh, you know, my childhood works when I was probably 20 or 18. And the, those works are still with me. And 
I, I would love to share uh, those works. And that's what I'm heading at. And there is a book that we are doing uh, with Jackfruit and uh, I'm looking forward to that. Wow. That sounds lovely to see a retrospective of 40 years I, of I, artwork. Uh, yes, I'm very, very exciting. excited about that. Uh, I had thought it to be done probably last year because I was turning 60, but last year is no year. So I'll be turning 60 this year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that was a gap year for everybody. Just everyone. That. Everyone. Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So let's, uh, I would invite you now to read an excerpt from your book, Experiencing the Goddess. And um, in the meanwhile, if we can have the, the slideshow, the film play on. So I'll be reading this uh, from my book, from our book, A Conversation Within, A Conversation Without. Touching the hearth with the tip of my toe, I connect with you from my heart to your soul. I just take out the next one. So Saptamatrikas, who they say struck terror, venerated thus for their dangerous fecundity, their terrible wrath. Yet were they not simply fulfilling their destinies, being protective, nurturing. In their zeal, they came to be represented for their darker powers, venerated in temples, as goddesses to be appeased, associated with gods, either as their spouses or as their forms of energies. Female principles that have been ritualized, iconized, cherished and feared. And so I undertake this journey. A parikrama, is it of self-realization? I empty myself to Maya. Maya captivating me, surprising me by my own responses to her different forms and manifestations. The more I understand her, the more I want to realize her. Maya, the illusion and the creator of illusion, I look within the womb to discover that which is outside. I become the womb. Armed with solace and caring, I am, I am the earth, ancient, primeval, modern, and all-encompassing. So the world, all nature tells me, so it shall tell you. So this is another, most of, I'm not reading any prose, I'm uh, going through all the poetry that I find uh, very unconnected, like close to me. Kill. Am I a myth or a reality? Today's reality is tomorrow's myth. Tomorrow's myth is yesterday's reality. I weave, I weave a web of illusion. I entice, create desires. Am I? Am I terrible, a destroyer? a slayer of all that entangles into my web, licking the root of their desires, vanquishing it, bestowing freedom to all who dare, who dare to play with me. I'm Maya, the fire within is without. I am the creator and the destroyer. Come, play with me. Now, this is the story of mind. Mind, which is just a space, one thought born, one thought dead, like forms, birds, relationships, rising like a bubble gum in my mouth, ending right there. Convictions trained by time, swallowing them, vanquishing them, 
licking them, erasing them, Maya laughing, giving it yet another chance to play with her. Enjoying this whole parody of blood, life, birth and death, and life again. And do I want to be liberated? Do I want to continue with this cave? This is to the dream. Do we, do we need to purify our dreams? Does desire steal through our open, unexpected and suspected doors while asleep? Is desire also a path to reach you, Kani? The red of your flowers flow in my veins as blood. Black of the night which you sail and slide is in the retina of my eyes. Your breath, your breath is the air that I breathe, Kali. You are the consciousness and the unconsciousness. Sarva Khalvitam Mayam. I changed it to this. Your touch celebrates everything. The future is surprise wound. The future is surprise wound. Pour me a dream, pour me a thought, pour me a feeling, pour me a hundred emotions, pour me a song. Walking, running, jumping, riding, flying high on those I reach you. You are within me. You are within me so potent, so alive. Still, still, I leap out to reach you. I see you in many, in the dry leaves of the tree whose blood I have sucked, dull and colorless, in the gray waters floating with my greed, in the lifeless air which wanted to breathe that endless kiss of love of eternity, I dared you to give me. I will not, I will not let you breathe. I will not let you live. And I go to the last one. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Death is not a full stop. The energy does not stop flowing at that point. It recoups, reforms and moves on. It's energy changing direction, cursing on again as a different form in different space. So I can go on and on, but I think I shall uh, end it right here. That was lovely. It was a lovely reading and and great to end with such beautiful verses that you have written and to see it alongside your images as well. So that was, uh, that was a great, great experience. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for uh, being with us. And uh, I do hope uh, you're able to get this book and uh, also read about the rest of the authors, Nilima, Nila, Nil, Dr. Nilima Chitkopikar, uh, Stella Dupe, Dr. Anamika Roy, and uh, Janet Chabla. So uh, they're all with me while I'm talking to you here. Thank you so much, everyone who is with us for this um, session and the book launch. Thank you so much. Thank you, Seema. Thank you, Habiba, for that absolutely fascinating visual language. I mean, delving into the yoginis, I must say, it's the most fascinating thing. And I'm going right out there to pick up your book, which you all of you can do from Amazon, even as we speak. We thank our celebration partners, Diageo. And thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Please stay locked on because you know we've got a whole 10 days of incredible sessions. Uh, featuring a stellar list of speakers that have been specially curated for you. As you're aware, all of us have been decimated. I know it's been difficult, even where each of you are. But if you can reach out and contribute just a little bit and help us make the world a safer place, push back on hatred 
and continue to bring a free flow of knowledge and ideas. We would love for you to support us at Teamwork Arts. Any contribution is more than welcome. Please tweet using the hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2021 and our Twitter handle Jaipur Lit Fest. The festival is protected by Dettol. See you in the next session. Thirteen years of a tumultuous Jaipur Literature Festival filled with joy, with colour, with the vibrancy and the sheer love of knowledge and literature. The Jaipur Literature Festival is actually, it's set a benchmark in terms of where Literature Fest ought to be. People think that to come here and listen to an author is a lot of people who are standing for a while. तो इससे पता चलता है कि अभी भी नॉलेज का जो की जो चाहत है वो अभी खत्म नहीं हुई। We had glamour, we had fun, we had joy, we had anger, we had protest. What in the Sanskrit tradition is called the Navras, where every human emotion is reflected upon. When I come to the Jaipur Literature Festival, I feel like I've walked in. To a three-star Michelin restaurant with absolutely no problem of bank balance. There's quality, there's quantity, and it's from all over the globe. And then came the pandemic, which brought to a screeching halt the entire world. We decided that we wouldn't allow the pandemic to stop us in our tracks. And out of this was born JLF's Brave New World. In these times uh, during COVID, when we're all sitting at home, it's it's sort of like a ray of light that we get to watch these amazing sessions when we can't all be together. It certainly brightens up my evenings. Today, in pandemic, we are digitally Jaipur Literature Festival, and I think that we are not in front of the audience. We are talking about the audience. But we can feel that feeling, that feeling, that thousands of people are connected to us, they are listening to us, and somewhere else, someone is in the shape of a shape of a shape. 160 episodes later and 4.8 million views, people who came online to view and listen to our incredible speakers from across the world. We were able to continue in our tradition of ensuring the free flow of knowledge and information. I think the very mention of JLF and the tradition of JLF energizes even when one has no live audience before one, when one is interacting, one still remembers there's a deep memory of what the JLF has brought us over the years and that is with us even when we are sitting at home and talking with just a couple of other persons. It's wonderful that the Jaipur Literature Festival has responded to the pandemic by, by continuing to exist. The Jaipur Literary Festival obviously is one of the most iconic literary festivals in the world and they've done a great job. Arriving virtually seems like a wonderfully sort of egalitarian and democratic thing to be able to do. India has always had a tradition of performed and spoken literature as well as uh, written literature. Uh, there are two, in, in a sense, different ways of imbibing literature. One is the written word, whether on stone or uh, in an epigraph or on, on a book, on a page. Uh, but there's also always been this long tradition of oral uh, recitation of work, whether in uh, uh, ancient uh, Sangam performances at the, at the courts of Tamil Nadu, or whether in the Mushairas uh, of the Mughal court. And today, I think, you know, in many ways, we're fulfilling that function, uh, allowing authors to perform their work. But there's also this thing of, of having rational debate. As we look ahead to the Jaipur Literature Festival 2021, bringing together a slew of incredible writers and speakers from across the world, we know we have a challenge. We will try and convey the same energy by shooting at Diggy Fort and Diggy Palace in Jaipur and bringing to you some of the most spectacular sessions that we've coined. I still wear the scarf that I was given at the Jaipur Literary Festival because it brings back a memory of those 
those joyous book loving crowds, the wonderful other writers from around the world. I've never had another experience like it. When I was last at the Jaipur Literature Festival, I inhaled so much goodness that I'm still kind of, I'm still working through it and I, I miss it when I think about it. So I get invited to festivals all over the world and by far this is my, one of my favorite. These are the greatest writers of our day on your screen for free at the Jaipur Literature Festival. We need your support, especially now. We look forward to you joining us online for the Jaipur Literature Festival digital version. I'm fascinated by the impermanence of experiences and especially unremarkable, unnoticed moments. Ordinary enough by themselves, but now these freeze frames mean light, conjunction and mood and take on a completely new interpretation. I'm a content creator slash producer. My first book was published in 2018 and this is my second. It is an art poetry collaboration with Neil Daswani, my photographs and his poetry. I like to describe myself as a banker by day and a poet by night. For me, 2020 was a busy purple patch. I produced and published three separate volumes of poetry, leading on to a fourth collaborative work with Anita Thomas titled Camera and Quill. I would send Neil a photograph and each time he would reply with a poem. Very soon we had a book. Hiding in the tall and golden grass, the marksman slowly sets his sights. He lets the stirring wind blow past. His shots ring out as though one. One by one he snuffs out suns and makes the sudden dark descend. Perhaps to himself he still pretends that he truly shot out all the light. I would look to you for cues, but you never made a sound. You never gave me any clues, though I'd flap my arms around. I shared with you my every dream, but then you never said a word. Since I'm not allowed to scream, I guess my anguish went unheard. Now I'll signal to you by semaphore and you'll tilt your tonsured head. You know, I wanted you so much more. But now, all my love for you is dead. White wings welded in the light add power to his thrust and flight. As he rises up to rejoin the skin, to flock together as a team again, as a canopy to the goose in front, no one bird ever takes the brunt. Each wingman was a leader once, the wedge is all but happenstance. White muletta whirling in wind and air, 
standing rock steady against the tide, threshing through waves as if to dare fish to jump out from where they hide. Spring cleaning the carpet of the sea, he flails at its fabric with his thresh, smoothens out folds so he can free, then coax all creatures to his mesh. Cameron Quill represents the coming together of two distinct and separate forms of art. And for both Anita and myself, we found that the true power of Cameron Quill lay in the synthesis. Thirteen years of a tumultuous Jaipur Literature Festival filled with joy, with colour, with the vibrancy and the sheer love of knowledge and literature. The Jaipur Literature Festival is actually, it set a benchmark in terms of where Literature Fest ought to be. People think that coming here and listening to an author, many people are standing for a long time. तो इससे पता चलता है कि अभी भी नॉलेज का जो आ, आ, की जो चाहत है वो अभी खत्म नहीं हुई है। uh, We had glamour, we had fun, we had joy, we had anger, we had protest. What in the Sanskrit tradition is called the Navras, where every human emotion is reflected upon. When I come to the Jaipur Literature Festival, I feel like I walked in. To a three-star Michelin restaurant with absolutely no problem of bank balance. There's quality, there's quantity, and it's from all over the globe. And then came the pandemic, which brought to a screeching halt the entire world. We decided that we wouldn't allow the pandemic to stop us in our tracks. And out of this was born JLF's Brave New World. In these times uh, during COVID, when we're all sitting at home, it's it's sort of like a ray of light that we get to watch these amazing sessions when we can't all be together. It certainly brightens up my evenings. Today, pandemic, we are digitally the literature festival. And I feel that our audience is not in front of us. We are talking in the same way. But we can feel that feel, that feeling, 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 160 episodes later and 4.8 million views, people who came online to view and listen to our incredible speakers from across the world. We were able to continue in our tradition of ensuring the free flow of knowledge and information. I think the very mention of JLF and the tradition of JLF energizes even when one has no live audience before one, when one is interacting, one still remembers there's a deep memory of what the JLF has brought us over the years and that is with us even when we are sitting at home and talking with just a couple of other persons. It's wonderful that the Jaipur Literature Festival has responded to the pandemic by, by continuing to exist. The Jaipur Literary Festival obviously is one of the most iconic literary festivals in the world and they've done a great job. Arriving virtually seems like a wonderfully sort of egalitarian and democratic thing to be able to do. India has always had a tradition of performed and spoken literature as well as uh, written literature. Uh, there are two, in, in a sense, different ways of imbibing literature. One is the written word, whether on stone or uh, in an epigraph or on, on a book, on a page. Uh, but there's also always been this long tradition of oral uh, recitation of work, whether in uh, uh, ancient uh, Sangam performances at the, at the courts of Tamil Nadu, or whether in the Mushairas uh, of the Mughal court. And today, I think, you know, in many ways, we're fulfilling that function, uh, allowing authors to perform their work. But there's also this thing of, of having rational debate. As we look ahead to the Jaipur Literature Festival 2021, bringing together a slew of incredible writers and speakers from across the world, we know we have a challenge. We will try and convey the same energy by shooting at Diggy Fort and Diggy Palace in Jaipur and bringing to you some of the most spectacular sessions that we've coined. I still wear the scarf that I was given at the Jaipur Literary Festival because it brings back a memory of those 
those joyous book loving crowds and the wonderful other writers from around the world. I've never had another experience like it. When I was last at the Jaipur Literature Festival, I inhaled so much goodness that I'm still kind of, I'm still working through it and I, I miss it when I think about it. So I get invited to festivals all over the world and by far this is my, one of my favorite. These are the greatest writers of our day on your screen for free at the Jaipur Literature Festival. We need your support, especially now. We look forward to you joining us online for the Jaipur Literature Festival digital version. Thank you.